Um, thanks to everybody who's here in person. Thanks to everybody who's here on Zoom. I'm Joshua Tucker. I'm the director of the Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia. It is my incredible pleasure today to welcome um, my uh, friend and co-author and colleague, Grigory Povelhesh, here to speak uh, to us today at the Jordan Center. He's presenting collaborative work, um, which I think is incredibly timely. Uh, we have a lot of people who are on Zoom, so just like the process for this is going to be that I uh, Rigo, you're going to talk for like 35, 40 minutes, something like that? Somewhere, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've given this talk before, so we'll see. All right, so I might go a little bit longer there. Um, and, we'll, um, and we'll have plenty of time for question and answer afterwards. But you can also, if you want to, if you're online and you want to interrupt and ask a question, please do raise your hand. I'll be on, we'll be online looking as, at those people in the audience. Feel free to raise hands and interrupt and ask questions along the way. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, Grigo is a professor of politics at Princeton University, um, jointly appointed in the School for Public and International Affairs and, and the Politics Department, and of course, the co-author of the wonderful Communism Shadow. So anyway, without further ado, it is my great pleasure to welcome you here today. So Grigo, thanks. And we'd like to appreciate the Paul. Paul, is there two of them? One that's here? They're, they're actually not here, unfortunately. Oh, they're not here. Okay. Yeah, so okay. thank you so much for the introductions. Thanks for having me. Thanks, uh, Sasha, for organizing. Thanks, everybody, for showing up in person. Uh, so first, a shout out to uh, to my co-authors uh, Isabel Bethisto, Laura Harrells, and uh, Jacob Tucker. They're all uh, PhD candidates at, uh, at Princeton, and we've been we've been doing this project together uh, for uh, almost two years now. Um, and so, what what I'm I'm going to talk to you today about is is uh, in a sense very timely given what's happening with the elections and uh, with the upcoming elections in in Russia. Where of course uh, Putin, uh, there's no question about the outcome. There may be some minor questions about uh, about the percentages, uh, and uh, so so the outcome is a foregone conclusion. But but the deeper question here is that sort of mix of uh, of uh, genuine support for Putin versus versus the fear versus the the indoctrination, the propaganda, and and, and all of the other stuff, and so. But what we're trying to do here, if we're focusing uh, on uh, with, uh, evidence from uh, uh, from attitudes towards the war primarily, but to understand the the extent uh, to which and why uh, Russians sort of go along, and sort of more importantly, if there may be ways of countering this uh, this regime propaganda and its its effectiveness on uh, uh, the attitudes of, uh, of Russians. So just to to start out with this, so. Uh, I'll talk in, in more in just a little bit about the, the data the, the, that we're using here. But here is uh, the seven uh, day moving averages of uh, support for the for the so-called uh, special military operation, because we cannot call it the war in Russia still, at least not in uh, survey questions. Uh, we don't want to run afoul. Um, and so this is starting in, uh, in uh, late May uh, 22. And uh, we have uh, uh, in dark blue, uh, strong support, uh, light blue, somewhat support, and then dark red is uh, strongly opposed and uh, uh, light red is uh, uh, somewhat opposed. But then what we see here is that over the course of, uh, of this time period, there are various ups and downs, some of them non-trivial, maybe as much as uh, up or down, uh, you know, 10% uh, in, over a period of a month or so. Uh, but overall, the, the, the proportion of, uh, of Russians who are in favor of the war, even two years after the war started, is somewhere in the 65% uh, range, right? Whereas the, the people who oppose it are probably somewhere in the 20 to 25%. Uh, um, maybe, at, you know, 30, uh, as, uh, as, as high as it gets. And you know, we see. I remember when we posted uh, uh, right for the two-year anniversary. It looked like things that were coming down. It's uh, it's this thing right over here. Uh, and then, of course, in the two weeks since, it's gone back up. Right. So so far, we have not seen any significant weakening uh, of this support for the war. If we then look at this, the different question, which is about whether this war is uh, going well. Right. It's one thing to say. I think this is a the right war, uh, and so on. It's another thing to say say it's going well. Here we see slightly different pattern in the sense that the modal response is not strongly agree, but somewhat agree. But nonetheless, still somewhere in the sixty to sixty five percent of uh, of respondents think that think that the war is going pretty well. Uh, which 
is remarkable considering uh, the, the number of uh, Russians who have died, not to speak obviously of the number of uh, Ukrainians, both uh, uh, military and civilians who have died, the undescribable uh, destruction and so on. But, but if we're just thinking of it from a Russian perspective, the notion that this is as steady as it is, is, is kind of uh, uh, remarkable, right? Um, so that then sort of raises this question of, of, of sort of how how this how this happens and and why and the short answer is that Russian propaganda is is very uh, effective. We've seen this not just in the data that I've shown you, but uh, I think one of the interesting pieces of information on this is that back in December uh, 80, uh, 21, um, a survey run by Henry Hale and uh, several of his uh, co-authors, uh, the part part of the Russian election study, they asked people whether they were in favor of, of Russia uh, going to war uh, against Ukraine. And at the time, 8% were in favor. Then, of course, Putin moves uh, ahead with this in a way that a lot of people didn't expect. And by March 2022, so less than three months later, 80% are in favor of the war. Right. So if we ever see an, uh, the ability, of course, there's rallying around the flag in the context of war and so on, but being able to... So this is not a case of... People always wanted the war, and now suddenly uh, they have it. It's like people were not necessarily that enthusiastic about the war, and then they definitely went along. Right? Um, and then moreover, and we have a bunch of these things on our, on our website as, as well, is that uh, there's a pretty widespread uh, uh, endorsement of, uh, of large parts of this sort of narrative about the war. So we have questions about whether they think that uh, uh, the leadership, the Ukrainian leadership are Nazis and roughly two thirds of the people uh, tend, tend to agree with this, uh, th those kinds of uh, questions. So, so these key, key sort of talking points in the, in the Russian uh, war propaganda are, seem to be endorsed by, by a pretty large proportion of uh, uh, Russian respondents. Um, and this again, despite the fact that the achievements have been uh, pretty limited. Uh, Russians have obviously taken uh, a fair bit of territory, but not nearly as much as they, they thought, and then a very high uh, human and material cost. Right? Um, and so, of course, one obvious question, and I'm happy to talk more about this uh, in the Q&A as well, is whether we can really trust these kinds of surveys anyway, right? Uh, the whole experience of uh, asking people in the midst of a war in an authoritarian regime about their attitudes is, is potentially uh, uh, fraught with, uh, with, with complications. We know that there's preference falsification in surveys uh, in general. Certainly, uh, we might be more worried in, in uh, authoritarian regimes. Uh, we have an, a, another working paper where we show that there's not very much of that happening. So at, at most, we find rough somewhere in the 5% range of actual preference falsification. One of the things that we find more of are people who have relatively soft preferences. And so they may say nominally that they're in favor of the, the war, but, but it's probably pretty close to the, uh, to the uh, sort of indifference line, right? But still, that does not change the fact that, that for, the, for the most part, it seems that the people who tell us that they're uh, in favor of the war seem to be in favor of the war. Right? And so, of course, this is nothing new. This, there's been a long-term pattern of, uh, of regime domination and manipulation of the information space. This literature goes back, obviously, even before some of these, uh, these studies that, uh, that, that I'm uh, citing here, right? There's a the sort of clear systematic efforts to exclude any, any critics, certainly among uh, uh, the campaigns against, uh, against journalists, campaigns against outlets that, that are critical of the regime and so on while at the same time uh, uh, right, uh, trying to undermine the, the uh, credibility of foreign sources. Right? Uh, it's not that hard for a Russian to access via VPN or other uh, methods outside sources, but the regime has been quite effective in trying to paint a lot of this kind of uh, 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 these critiques as coming from people who are trying to take down Russia uh, as, as being motivated by by, by a variety of questionable, unpatriotic, and so on uh, 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 motivations here, right? And of course, this has been exacerbated even more in the context of the war. Now, Russia is uh, once again sort of seeing itself as being attacked by, by everybody uh, around them. And so this, this notion of, of 
questioning the, the these sort of outsiders and associating even domestic critics with the outside uh, uh, with uh, with outsiders is uh, is, is uh, far farther exacerbated. And so the big question here, in some sense, is: Will there anything? Is there anything that that can sort of go against this? Right? Is is this really such a such a foolproof uh, way of uh, of, uh, of uh, controlling a, a population and again keeping in mind that this is a, a quite a uh, quite an educated uh, population this is not uh, you know th th we're not talking about sort of a, a very sort of simple type of setup where you tell a bunch of illiterate peasants something this is this is a, a much more population with 85 uh, percent internet access theoretically all kinds of options of, of getting additional information and so on and so in trying to answer this question, uh, we were trying to, to address this broader question about source credibility in authoritarian regimes. So how can we say something that's different from what the regime is saying in a way that may be uh, in, in some sort of way credible to a, to a sort of Russian audience, right? Uh, and there's a big literature in, uh, in communications about, uh, about source credibility, not surprisingly. Right, uh, they they talk, and there's a bunch of the debates that I'm not going to get into here about multiple dimensions. There's a question of competence, right? So if you hear something from a so from a particular source, it matters whether you think that they know what they're talking about or not. This could be certain types of credentials. It could be certain types of institutional affiliations, pedigrees, and so on. It could be the way that people talk, whether they have the right accent, whether they look the right way, uh, etc. Et uh, but then there's also two uh, additional dimensions. Um, and sometimes there is debates about whether these are really different or not. One of them is trustworthiness, and the other one is goodwill or intent. In other words, is the person who's delivering the message on my side or not, in some sort of basic way? Are they trying to, to are they my allies or are they my, my opponents, in a way? Right. And this, of course, has been, to some extent, uh, discussed in, in political science as well. Much of this literature is, uh, tends to be on democratic regimes and in free media context, right? We have a large literature on fake news and disinformation, who believes, what, does it matter, what sources it's coming from, and et cetera. There's also questions about the partisan alignment. Do we believe things that if our, if our opponents are uh, telling them, you know, you look, look at stuff on Fox News and they tell you something, are you going to believe it or not? Vice versa for other people with MSNBC or CNN or whatever it is, right? So... These are questions that have been discussed a fair bit in the context of, of democratic regimes. The question is, how would we apply this in a, to, to an authoritarian uh, setting? Um, there's some work on this, not a whole lot. Uh, most of it is actually focused more on the credibility of regime propaganda. A lot of this is uh, work uh, on, on Russia and China, but there's some other work as well on Rwanda, for example. Um, and then there's uh, some recent work by Aliukov and Zavatskaya, where they're looking at both regime and opposition messages and efforts to, to debunk some of these so sort of correcting information. And what they find is that actually uh, uh, opposition efforts to try to debunk some of the state information tend, tend to be relatively ineffective and sometimes even counterproductive, right? Uh, similarly, there's a recent paper in Comparative Political Studies uh, by Arnold et al., uh, where they look at, uh, at source effects for different kinds of claims in China. And there too, they, they don't find uh, they don't find big differences. Part of the problem with that article is that they don't really have an opposition source. They have a government source and a, and a sort of neutral uh, source. Uh, but but overall, we don't have a good sense. Uh, it, there's no reason to think that uh, that credibility doesn't matter in an authoritarian setting. But exactly how it matters, it manages to counteract what is an incredibly un uneven playing field and a very limited uh, alternative uh, options of information is, is a different question. So this is where our contribution comes in. And uh, I should say that we've presented sort of a early version of this paper a few months ago, uh, a seminar at, at, at Harriman. And there we focused on some of the empirics that we showed you here, but we focused them from, on them from a different perspective. So this is in a way a sort of new theoretical take partly based on feedback that we got uh, there. And so what we're trying to do is, is uh, uh, focus specifically on this question on source credibility in these uh, opposition uh, anti-regime messages in authoritarian setting, right? Are there certain types of, of sources uh, that are likely to be more credible uh, than others? 
And then also to, to highlight the role of, uh, of uh, issue-specific competence, right? So that's one of the dimensions that I mentioned up there. Uh, but very much of what we tend to do is, is this whole sort of idea, of, is this message coming from my enemy or is it coming from my friend, is it, uh, et cetera. And we're trying to highlight here a little bit that it might also matter whether this, these sources are seen as having competence on that particular issue. Right. So it's not just do I trust you to, that you want that you're my ally or not, but do you know what you're talking about? Right? And this is especially true in the fog of war in some sense. Okay. So quickly about the data. So this is based on the Russia Watcher project, and we started uh, uh, together with my uh, co-author. Uh, running this tracking survey on Russian public opinion. We've been doing it on a daily basis since late May 2022, so we're coming close to two years now. We started out initially uh, with 200 responders per day, and then we got an NSF grant uh, uh, last spring, and we've been able to ramp up the, the sample size, uh, which, which is helpful, particularly around sort of specific events. You have yeah, sort of larger, larger samples to sort of notice differences. And we have a bunch of questions that are asked on a daily basis. Some of them are asked two or three times a, a week, obviously about war support, about political trust towards both particular institutions and particular individuals. And then a bunch of uh, uh, both specific questions about current events, but also gives us the opportunity, as we'll show you, I'll show you in a second, to see how some events that may not be foreseeable affect these kinds of trends in terms of trust, in terms of various types of evaluations of the war and so on, right? Um, and then uh, the other thing that we, we have been able to do, and I'll show you a few examples of that, is uh, we've been uh, uh, running some survey experiments uh, on a, well, some of them specific to certain events, others just more general theoretical interests, and uh, that allows us to, to, to sort of triangulate between some of this overtime data and some of the, some of the experiments. Now, you can... Uh, Go to our website. You can also follow us on uh, Twitter or X or whatever it's called these, uh, these days. Um, so uh, happy to sort of engage more with this afterwards. So as a starting point for this, um, and this was, like I said, sort of the, the original uh, uh, paper is when Prigozhin came out. Uh, so that maybe I should start with a big brief background. I imagine pretty much everybody knows about Prigozhin, but he's, he was uh, uh, this uh, very prominent Russian uh, businessman, former catering magnate uh, who was close to Putin and uh, sort of used some of these connections to basically create a, uh, an empire, the most important part of it uh, being this PMC Wagner group, uh, which uh, ended up having operations in Syria in uh, uh, various African countries, uh, etc. And then, importantly for our purposes, uh, came to play a pivotal role in, uh, in, the, in the war in Ukraine. Right? Um, and it's hard to overemphasize how central uh, uh, Prigozhin was in this, in this, uh, this sort of months, uh, certainly sort of the first year of the war, a little bit over a year of, uh, of, the, of the war. Uh, partly because the, the Wagner group uh, were, were being sent into all of the, the toughest uh, places, partly because of the whole story of them uh, uh, recruiting uh, prisoners from uh, Russia's prisons and bringing them there. Uh, so, you know, it made, in some sense, it made for, for, for good, uh, for good uh, news uh, coverage. Um, and at the same time, and this is the part that's important, right? On the one hand, he was this sort of heroic figure. I mean, Obviously, it's problematic. I think even in the eyes of many Russians, uh, not to speak of the rest, uh, the, the, the rest of the world, but he was somebody who was getting something done on the on the on the battlefield, and at the same time engaged in the type of public criticisms, especially against the Russian Ministry of uh, Defense, uh, and making some very harsh and very uh, specific accusations about mismanagement, about not getting uh, materials, uh, about people dying because of uh, the, the political leadership being absent and so on, right? And, uh, and so what we're going to do here is we're, we're first going to show you some, some the effects of some of his interventions on, on some of the political uh, public opinion data over time, and then we'll, we'll, we'll show you an experiment as well. And so, using the looking at the observational data, so uh, uh, 
Prigozhin had several of these interventions. And the most important of them are February 21st. Then there was a series of, uh, of uh, interventions uh, starting from April 29th to uh, May 4th. And then that's the July 23rd uh, video that we'll uh, leverage again a little bit later uh, that then preceded the mutiny of, uh, of June 24th uh, and his downfall essentially, right? And so if we look at this here, and this is not that easy to see, but we have, so here we have the, the Shoigu, so Sergei Shoigu is the, uh, the Minister of Defense uh, for, for Russia. And you can see that people have pretty strong approval of him, uh, not quite as strong as for Putin, as you'll see in just a, 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 just a second. And then basically, since all of these, uh, since all of these attacks were very sort of squarely uh, uh, launched at uh, Shoigu, uh, we're, we're sort of looking at, at these effects. Here you can see a little bit of an effect, especially among the strong uh, supporters. Here you see somewhat more of an effect, it's, uh, again, uh, uh, among the strong supporters. And then after, interestingly, after uh, June 24th, even though that event brings down uh, Prigozhin, it also you can see a pretty significant effect in the in the sort of uh, support for uh, trust in Shoigu. Uh, at the same time, if you look at Putin, there's not very much of an effect there, right? Not only does he have higher levels overall, but he does not seem to be affected very much by this. For those of you who are interested in this kind of stuff, we also looked at the regression discontinuity uh, uh, tests to sort of see whether these events, which were, you know, they're not expected necessarily. He just kind of, you know, he would come and make these, these announcements. And we do find some effects uh, for Shoigu, both for uh, uh, for February, to some extent for, for uh, April and May, but here it's a little tricky because we have two events that are close to each other. So that sort of throws things off a little bit. And then uh, definitely for uh, for June twenty fourth, yeah. Yeah, can, can you just say a word about how how to think about this in terms of the framework you were talking about a moment ago about competency? Yeah, like so is the idea here that like Prigozhin is competent to speak to the performance of the Minister of Defense, but not to the President? So so that's a, that's a good question, and this is uh, this is so this is in a way just sort of showing that he seems to have some sort of influence. And then trying to disentangle what what this influence is based on, right? If we think about where his where his uh, his uh, credit source credibility comes from? On the one hand, he's somebody who's uh, who's you know he's there in the field. He sort of sees these things. In terms of trustworthiness, I don't know, right? I mean, he's been in jail. He's been he's, he's like he's not exactly your 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 classic uh, example of uh, of, tr of a trustworthy individual. Um, and then in, in in terms of the alignment, certainly before the the mutiny, he is somebody who fights for Russia. Uh, or, or, however conceived in, in, in this way, right? So, so this is more about sort of showing whether there seems to be an effect of uh, Prigozhin saying things. Okay, but we're not supposed to interpret this Putin versus Shoigu thing in the context of this competent no, argument. No, no, and I'll show you in a second why, why I think partly why we don't see Putin effects. I mean, there, there are probably a number of other reasons yeah. as well. People have much stronger opinions of Putin than they do of Shoigu. Like right? people didn't think very much of Shoigu until uh, until uh, basically the. I mean, you know, probably a little bit during the first Donbas war, but there the Russian army wasn't involved in the same direct way that it was here, right? So, so he becomes much more prominent and much more uh, criticized in some sense uh, uh, with the with the war. And so to try to get a little bit more at this question, what we did is we then uh, ran a survey experiment uh, in, in sort of uh, July uh, 2023. So uh, where obviously this had to be done after the, uh, after the mutiny, unfortunately, uh, and we had to give it a few, uh, a few uh, weeks for things to, to settle down a little bit. Uh, and essentially what we did is we, we, we gave people uh, quotes from this uh, video that, uh, that he put out. And that video, if, if you haven't seen it, uh, it's, uh, it's quite an experience. Uh, I, I will not put it up here because it's, uh, it's, it's kind of harsh. Uh, but, but, so I will, but I will read you a little bit. So the, the, the idea is that we have, he makes two types of claims. One of them having to do with the motives, why they went to war. And the other one having to do with the conduct of the war. Right? And we basically picked parts of his uh, video that try to sort of focus more on one or the other, to see whether different types of his argument basically matter in different ways. And so the first one says, 
The Ministry of Defense is trying to deceive the public, trying to uh, deceive the president, to tell the story that Ukraine was planning to attack with all the NATO bloc. Uh, however, the so-called special operation was started on uh, 24th of February for completely different reasons. War was necessary so that a bunch of guys could triumph and uh, show off our stronger armies. War wasn't necessary to return Russian citizens to our bosom and uh, not to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine. Right. So these are like some pretty harsh and direct uh, uh, statements contradicting the the, the, the traditional and the, the official uh, regime uh, rhetoric about the war. Right. And then the other one, the conduct one, basically says they still think that they can win this war, but since there is no leadership, there are no successes. Uh, the leadership of the Ministry of Defense is totally lying uh, to the president, and the president receives reports that don't reflect reality. There are two reports on the ground, uh, the, uh, one, one on the ground and the other one at the president's desk. The Ukrainian armed forces are pushing through the R Russian army. We are awash in blood. Nobody is giving us reserves. There is no management. Right? So these are some pretty straightforward, again, this is the war is not going well. This is the fault of certain people in the Ministry of Defense. Do notice that in both of these, and this is partly why we put this in, Putin is the one who is being misled, right? It's like the Tsar is good, but the boyars are, are, are wrong, right? So, so even in this, and I think uh, Prigozhin tried to hedge this very carefully. He was, his bold pick was with the Ministry of Defense and uh, with Gerasimov to uh, uh, some extent, not with Putin, at least not, not open. Uh, and so, so now what we're going to do, we also had one where we showed both. It turns out that people did not spend as much time on the combined one. So the effects on that, there are some effects, but they're not as strong as they are for the, for the separate ones. And then there's a control one where we have a quote from, uh, from Prigozhin, where he talks about public catering and uh, meals for kids or something along those lines, right? Um, and so here's the, uh, here are the effects of these treatments on, uh, on success per, uh, perceptions. So I, what I should uh, say is that we're, we're going to show effect uh, both weight and uh, weighted and not weighted. Uh, not surprisingly, perhaps these online surveys don't give you samples that are completely reflective of the Russian population. So the weighted ones tend to give higher weight to less educated and older respondents who tend to be underrepresented in these surveys, which is partly why you, you sometimes see weaker results in the weighted, not in this particular graph, but in some of the others. So if you look at the modus treatment, so, so uh, actually before, before uh, getting into this, let me, let me sort of quickly walk you through, especially for those of you who don't do statistics uh, on a regular uh, basis. So the idea here is that the, these estimates that you see are the effect, are the difference between the people who got one of those two critical statements compared to the people who got the, the neutral treatment, the stuff about Prigozhi being a caterer and, uh, and, and, and whatever, right? And the, the the estimates tell you whether the effect is in a negative or a positive direction. So here, these are pre, uh, uh, war support, per, uh, war uh, success perceptions, and you see that the effects are negative. The, the dotted line is zero, right? So the people who get these treatments tend to think that the war is less successful. And when the confidence interval don't overlap with zero, that means that the effect is significant at ninety-five uh, percent. Some of these things you can see are relatively close. And so the main take home for this one here is that the motives treatment has a slight negative effect, but it's not close to being statistically significant. On the other hand, the conduct, as we would expect, right? I mean, this is the one that's more directly talking about how the war is not going well, does see, have a significant effect for the unweighted and marginally significant for the, for the weighted versions, right? So it does make a dent in the sense that the war is going well. Now, what about the goals, right? We saw that the modus treatment in particular focused on, on sort of questioning these goals of the, of, the, uh, of the treatment. And what we see here is that if we look at the unweighted data, none of the effects are significant except for the one that says that the war was launched to, to defend Russia, right? They're all sort of negative. This one is almost, uh, is basically zero. Right? And then the effects are even weaker when we use the weighted data. So in other words, the motives treatment, even though it very sort of clearly contradicts these narratives about why the war came about, they don't seem to do very much. Um, and then if we look at the uh, at, uh, effects on, uh, on the Ministry of Defense uh, and, and Putin, and here this sort of goes uh, maybe a little bit to Josh's question, right? Here we see again that the conduct, one seems to, the, to uh, reduce at least to some extent the, the trust in the Ministry of Defense. So the people who get the conduct treatment tend to think worse about the Ministry of Defense. The motives one doesn't do anything. Okay? So 
what are the, some of the preliminary uh, conclusions here? And this is in a way, takes you through the way we, we thought about this, right? Is that we, we looked at this data and we, we, we noticed, first of all, that there are these effects, uh, especially for the poor conduct uh, uh, message, but they tend to be pretty narrow. Right? They tend to be on the, the issue that the, uh, about the conduct and on the Ministry of Defense, not on Putin, not on the broader, uh, not on the rest of the stuff. And not very much for the motives. And so then the question is, given that these are coming from the same person, right? Prigozhin is no more or less of a criminal in one treatment than in the other. Why is it that one of the messages works and the other one doesn't? Uh, and our conjecture, basically, this is not something that we had really certainly didn't pre-register it uh, and we, we didn't uh, sort of necessarily think about it in advance, is that when you think about it, Prigozhin has, uh, uh, has reasonably, so there's, you know, his position towards the regime is, is the same, he's still criticizing the regime and, 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 and so on, but the variation is in the competence, right? So in some sense, being on the field there, and there are all these videos of him hanging out with the soldiers in their, in their uh, military uniforms and, and all of that. He has credibility for claiming that things are not going well there. He's seeing these people dying, uh, uh, etc. On the other question about, you know, who was in these rooms trying to cook up the, the, uh, cook up the, the war in Ukraine, Prigozhin was not hanging out in the Ministry of Defense in uh, January, February uh, 2022. So the, I'll admit that this is a conjecture, but this is this is the sort of thing that we're then basically trying to to test with with these two additional experiments. And I'll try. I don't want to go for, for too long, uh, but yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. first. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Could it be uh, that maybe the Russians were more or less aware that the uh, reasons weren't actually the ones uh, presented officially. Mm -hmm. And so by them being aware of this uh, at a conscious or subconscious level, uh, then Prigozhin wouldn't have actually revealed any additional information? That's a, that's a good question. That's a reasonable question. We, we, we cannot tell this apart, right? So, so it's, uh, in, in some sense, uh, there's, Fair bit of information about the war, and people know that people that you know people are coming back in body bags. There's uh, there is uh, so you might almost think that there is more information about the not, war not going that well. They were certainly told that it's going to take two weeks, and then it was you know this was however many months uh, later. But in in some sense, uh, it's hard to disentangle the specific issue on which we're focusing from from th this expertise, which is why we're going to some of the other uh, the other experiments. Yeah, uh, and there is some contradiction. It looks like this, that when you present uh, dynamics, then you expect kind of this information being acquired by most of the uh, samples, at least, or some, some part of sample, which is maybe problematic. We don't know which sample actually got this information from from, uh, from pre mm -hmm. But um, in experiments, you kind of it's different than you assume that people not already participate because they might be all treated already because it was quite popular. Mm -hmm. um, so it's mm -hmm. kind of in one, so it's one or another, right? E either it should impact immediately because people know it. Mm -hmm. uh, and if they know it, then your experiment shouldn't work because they are treated. And maybe that's um, cool. So, so you know, so def definitely, this this is not the first time that that is uh, that they hear, and it, it's quite possible that some of these people saw the video too, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, in some sense, this may be. I mean, a it may be reminding them something that they saw briefly uh, before. It's also possible that there are some people who saw it and others who didn't, and so the, our experiment gets at some of the people who didn't move. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at the if you look at the the overtime data, those are not spectacular uh, sizes. These, by the way, are not very large effects either, I should mm -hmm. say, right? So, so this, is, this is on the margin, and I think it's something to remember in general with this, with the experiments, right? We should, like, if we saw massive effects from them reading 100, uh, no, 70 words of text of somebody telling them something, we should be probably suspicious, right? It takes a little bit longer than that to change people's mind about it. The question is just, can you make some sort of a dent? And if so, for what types of questions? Um, and so here's here's uh, another uh, experiment, and this is actually something that we have run. Can I ask a question before you go on the second experiment? Yeah. So 
I just want to push again, push you a little bit mm -hmm. on this credibility mm -hmm. thing and maybe ask a little bit about like where that is vis-a-vis -vis the literature. Mm -hmm. Because I could imagine, right, I could imagine that you would say, all right, so a person has credibility or doesn't have credibility, mm -hmm. right? Like you're a doctor or you're not a doctor, right? Like, mm -hmm. and so it could be at the level of the individual. Then it could be at the level of the, then you could go down a level and you could say, okay, well, a person could have credibility. I could have credibility talking about post-communist politics, but I don't have credibility talking about medicine. Okay, mm -hmm. great. But then it seems like here you've gone down like a whole other level, which is like, you're like, the, the you went to the, you know, the person, yes or no, the issue, the war. But now you're saying like within the war, there's still this credibility can go even further, like battlefield conduct mm -hmm. versus the versus the, the causes of the war. Like yeah. in the literature that you guys are drawing from, when people mm -hmm. talk about source credibility, do they tend to like keep pushing down so far into the level? I mean, like obviously yeah. the advantage of pre-registering versus not pre-registering, and it's like it's only speculation on your part. But I'm just kind of curious about like, would this be pushing the literature forward to kind of take it to this like subdivision between different aspects of credibility on the war? Yeah, so I mean, I you know, the problem is that it's hard to compare the war to other types of issues, right? Like, yeah. I mean, when you when you sort of compare these things, I mean in the communications literature, there are all kinds of, you know, where they sort of they probably show things. Where you know once this thing is is endorsed by a doctor and another time it's endorsed by somebody who looks like a snake oil, uh, you know sometimes they're the same. Uh, but uh, but but uh, but so so the the question of of how far down this expertise goes. Like I said, this was this was more a, an effort to try to understand this this tension between the effects that we see on the success and the lack of effects that we see on the motives. And so it's it's almost raising a hypothesis that we then uh, use to look at the, with this other data. Okay. And I'll show you in just a second. So here's Alat Pugatrova. I don't know how many of you have, have listened to, uh, to her music. She's quite uh, quite famous during the Soviet era, also in the in the sort of early uh, 90s. To this day, in 2012, she was actually voted with, uh, number two on the list of 100 most influential women in Russia. Also, interestingly, number four on uh, a list of smartest women in Russia in 2012. Um, and then basically in 2000, September 2022, she comes uh, out with this public statement against uh, the war uh, uh, that's triggered by the, the fact that her husband was designated as a foreign agent. She and her husband left uh, uh, Russia to go to Israel right after the war erupted. She then came back, this whole back and forth. And she basically says, I don't know if you can read this, I'll read it for you. I asked to enlist me in the uh, uh, list of uh, foreign agents of my beloved country because I'm solidary with my husband, an honest, decent, and sincere person, true and incorruptible patriot of Russia, with, who wishes the motherland prosperity, peaceful life, freedom of speech, and an end of the deaths of our men, for the illusory goals that make our country an outcast and make the, difficult, the life uh, difficult for our citizens. Right? So there are sort of two parts of this message here. And my argument would be, again, this is not pre-registered, but there's, uh, there's variations in the credibility and competence, right? Presumably, she's a pretty good uh, uh, judge of her husband's character and might know something about it. She's also gotten to experience this being, being designated a foreign agent. And so maybe people are willing to give her some sort of credibility that her husband is not a foreign agent and a spy. Right. Whereas on the war goals and consequences, uh, the types of expertise and the competence that she has may be much more limited. Right. Certainly compared to the average rush. Right? And so what we did is we, we ran this uh, this online experiments uh, experiment in September of 2022 with uh, 1300 uh, respondents. And what I'm going to show you is the effect of of. Uh, getting this statement from Pugachova compared to uh, uh, somebody uh, getting a, a sort of neutral statement. Um, and here's, here, are the, here are the effects of the, the treatment on success uh, perceptions. And as you can see, they're pretty much around zero. If anything, it's maybe a little bit positive. So the people who get the Pugachova thing, not that this is a significant effect, but if anything, it goes in the wrong direction. Right? So it doesn't move the people into thinking that the war is not going well. Um, neither does it make them want to cancel the, the special military operation. In fact, if anything, the effects are negative. And so the people who get this don't, don't get pushed in the direction that we, would, we might expect this message to push them. Uh, and then moreover, in case you think that there's just sort of not enough power or whatever, the people who get her statement 
are more likely to say that cultural people should not talk about politics and uh, that they should not influence politics, right? So there's a backlash in terms of saying, you go do your singing, don't come and tell us about the war and about this stuff. But then the thing that's interesting, and these are sort of marginal results, I should say, is that when we had a question about whether the foreign agent law under which her husband was accused protects Russians, here we see a negative effect that's almost significant when it's uh, with the, with the uh, unweighted data, somewhat weaker when, uh, with, with the weighted data. Right? So here, people are willing to give her some sort of credibility. Again, not smoking gun evidence, but it points in, in, a, in a similar direction as, as the stuff with, uh, with, with Prigozhin. And then finally, we did the third experiment, uh, uh, and uh, this, this, uh, which looks at uh, blame for Russian casualties. And this was done in uh, September 2022 in the midst of the Ukrainian uh, counteroffensive. The time Russia was losing territory, they were losing lots of people. Uh, this is not a good time in the war for them. Um, and so we tried to sort of see how people reacted to, to different framings uh, uh, of, of these losses. And so we have basically three conditions. One of them is uh, what we call the, the unsourced flawed operation. And this is a quote from, a, from an article. This came from BBC, uh, but we didn't tell them that. We just told them, here's a, here's a uh, news article. We'll show you in a second. And it basically says, Right, the combination of poor tactics, limited air cover, the lack of flexibility and preparation of command of addressing for addressing failures and repeated errors have led to a high level of casualties among Russian forces, which has continued to grow over the course of the offensive in Donbass. Right? So very much sort of saying, okay, people are dying because the Russian military was not well prepared. But here it was, like I said, it was just said, here's a, read this uh, excerpt from, a, from an article. Then there's a second uh, treatment, which has the same text, but then at the end says, they are saying in Britain. So we did not say the BBC, but we sort of, we, we, we told them this is coming from the, the British. And, you know, in retrospect, it might have been, I mean, we didn't want to lie about who it's coming from. Uh, so, uh, so uh, but anyway, so, so this attributes this statement to somebody. Right? And then finally, there's a control group where they basically just say, uh, unfortunately, some of our comrades have been killed and wounded. And in some cases, we tell them that this is from a spokesman of the Ministry of Defense, and in others, we don't. And so we're going to compare the flawed operation and the uh, source uh, versus uh, unsourced to this control group. Right. Um, and so what we see here, which is interesting, and uh, again, in, in some sense, potentially surprising, is that the source treatment, i.e. the one where it says they say in Britain, has a significant negative effect on uh, the uh, success perceptions, right? Whereas the, the one that's unsourced, that would just said here, read this article, is not. Right? Uh, on the other hand, if we then ask them about whether you want to cancel the war, ca cancel the special military operation, we get no results for either of them. So this, is, this, I think, adds an, an interesting nuance. And so, so on the one hand, it shows that this uh, source treatment is more effective, even, to, even though it's coming from the enemy source, right? It's coming from the Brits. It's not coming from the Chinese or from somebody else. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it, it does not translate into the sort of desire to stop the war. Right? It's perfectly possible to say this war is not going well, and therefore we need to do more to sort of push forward. And so then this gets us to the question of, okay, I've tried to sell to you this story about, uh, about uh, the, the competence, the, the expertise. What about the alignment story? And there's, there's uh, particularly, are these treatments more effective uh, for those who are predisposed to believe them? And there's a lot of evidence for this from, from democracies that we tend to believe for stories that come from our co-parties and from other sources that are otherwise seen as, uh, as friendly. Of course, in our setting, this is a little bit tricky, partly because a lot of the opposition voices within Russia have been have been uh, uh, have been uh, sidelined and uh, and so on. And there's this bias against uh, foreign sources, and then there's also importantly, I think, ethical and practical concerns. Uh, the, the regime has restrictions about uh, spreading information that comes from sources that have been blocked within Russia. So we have to be careful. Like the BBC, BBC is not blocked. Uh, whereas other types of uh, uh, sources are. And also we wanted to be, uh, both for IRB reasons and in general for ethical reasons, uh, using deception to claim that 
somebody who's an oppositionist thinks that the war is going well or to claim that somebody in the government thinks that the uh, war is going badly. That is not something we wanted to do in this way. So uh, so we, we did not push it in, the, in, the, in this di the direction. But the thing that we can do is to try to think a little bit more about, about sort of how the source alignment might, might work, especially among subgroups of people. There's of course the question of how these people are are being uh, are, are perceived, in particular Prigozhin and Pugacheva by 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 the uh, by the Russian respondents, right? Prigozhin could in some ways be be sort of seen as this misguided patriot, and this is a little bit of the message that until you know he got killed, even Putin sort of kept going back and forth between saying you know this is treason, and then on the other hand, but he was trying to do the right thing and so on. Pugacheva was a you know is definitely a Russian icon, right? So she's one of ours at some level. She was not a particularly uh, prominent critic, even though she became more critical as, as, as the war started. And then of course, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, Britain context, the Brits are sort of the enemy, right? They're, not, they're definitely not somebody who would, you would sort of think would, 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 would be aligned with, with what the Russian public would, would sort of see as uh, their allies. Um, and so what we're going to do very quickly is, is to, to look at pre-treatment preferences, both about the war and about the regime, to see whether, whether uh, for uh, issues ha having to do with uh, uh, war-related questions, we're going to look at prior uh, war support. And for uh, domestic questions, we're going to look at, uh, at the approval, uh, uh, at Putin approval, right? So these are questions that are asked in the same survey, but before we did the experiment. And so we can see whether people who before getting this information, we're inclined to, to sort of buy the story or not, how they get affected by this. And so for the Prigozhin experiment, this is the, the, the one evidence piece of evidence that we have that there seems to be a sort of uh, alignment bias story, right? So the people who were war opponents before they were given this information, they get the treatment about Prigozhin saying that the war is going badly, and they become more negative about how the war is going. On the other hand, if we look at uh, war supporters, there's no effect, right? So for those guys, Prigozhin coming and saying this stuff doesn't seem to make a difference. On the other hand, if we look at the trust in the Ministry of Defense, this is now as a function of whether they're Putin supporters or Putin opponents, we can see that the effects are small, but they're, they're basically the same for both, right? So here it's not that Opposition people are more likely to say, "Well, that must mean that uh, the the Shoigu is uh, that the Ministry of Defense is uh, is incapable or not, right?" So it's a, it's it's a there we don't see a story. Then if we look at the Pugacheva experiment, there's no effect uh, for anyone uh, on SMO success, right? So irrespective of whether you're in favor of the war or not in favor of the war, you read Pugacheva's experiment uh, statement and it doesn't change your view. So even the people who don't like the war don't get moved by uh, by Pugacheva saying this. Uh, there's a little bit maybe of an effect of a difference between uh, uh, on the foreign agent law in the direction that we would expect, right? So if you're a Putin supporter, <coughs> it gives you a slightly negative effect and it gives you a slightly positive effect if you're a Putin opponent. But none of those things are uh, significant and they're not significantly different from each other. In other words, not much of a partisan story here either. And then finally, and this I think is quite interesting as well, is when we look at the, uh, at the, uh, the, the flawed uh, conduct, uh, so the stuff about the, the, Britain, the Brits saying that this is, uh, the, the people are dying because it's not run well, what's really remarkable is that war supporters actually have negative, pretty consistent negative effects, right? If anything, it's the weak war opponents who are weaker. And so these guys react to that story of some unnamed British source criticizing the conduct in a way that that should not be that is sort of incompatible with a story where you discount what what the opponents are saying. On the other hand, on the cancellation, we see no effect anymore. Okay. All right. So finally, at the conclusions, um, sorry for going for going uh, along. So. I've shown you that there are that we're able to find some instances where, where uh, we can get a successful intervention against the, the regime war message, right, from a different uh, uh, sources. 
But I think one of the important things to keep in mind, in addition to the fact that a lot of these effect, uh, results are effects are not very large in substantive terms, <laughs> is they tend to be very narrowly focused on the immediate message, right? So it's SMO success and the Ministry of Defense for the Prigozhin experiment. It's the uh, foreign agent law in the Pugachova experiment. And then it's uh, 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 SMO success uh, for the casualty blame experiment, right? Whereas other types of things like higher level effects about whether you want to cancel the war or whether you uh, or whether you trust Putin do not uh, seem to get affected. Now, we don't know whether this is just a, a function of these uh, particular interventions not being as effective for those questions, whether people just have stronger priors on those, right? People have thought about Putin for many, many years now. And as a result, one piece of information of Shoigu saying, or of uh, Prigozhin saying something may not change these things around in 20 seconds, right? Um, and we may need longer interventions. Right? Something that, that took decades to build up in terms of propaganda should not be undone in, in such a short period of time. Uh, we do find uh, this tentative uh, uh, evidence that, uh, that this kind of issue expertise matters. Uh, we've already talked about this, right? So Prigozhin on the war conduct, but not necessarily on the motives. Pugachova on the foreign agent law, but not necessarily on the war. And then the fact that the source over uh, uh, flow uh, conduct uh, experiment uh, uh, treatment is stronger than the unsourced one, even though the sourced one comes from the enemy, right? So this goes sort of in the opposite direction. And then on source alignment, as I said, uh, we have this one piece of evidence uh, of, uh, of it mattering on, on the Prigozhin experiment, but not other ones. In terms of next steps, we're trying to think, partly to disentangle some of these questions that were asked, is, is we can if we can find a systematic manipulation of this expertise and alignment story, right? Whether, whether we can, without uh, uh, trying to, uh, uh, to uh, when fool people about, uh, without lying to people, uh, whether, whether we can basically tell them in one case that this person is an expert, in another case, tell them some, uh, something else, and also vary the extent to which this person is seen as being for or against the war as a, as a function of this. Uh, and then the other option would be to try to look at the strength of priors, right, to sort of see whether among people who had relatively weaker prior attitudes, whether their this opportunity to make a change is different than for the people who are at the extreme of the two. Of the two uh, uh, and finally, I would be obviously very happy to get your suggestions. Thank you for this. Great. Okay. We have, as is often the case in these post-pandemic days, more people online than we have in the room here. So I want to—I definitely want to invite everybody online to ask questions as well. So please just uh, raise your hand, or if it's easier for you, if you want to put something in the chat, that's fine. I can read stuff in the chat too. Um, but let's start with people who are in the room. Are there any? Yeah, go ahead. Um, yes, could it possibly be that what uh, changes people's perceptions or uh, amplifies them? is being exposed to uh, credible sources from the other side. So for example, uh, in the case with Prigozhin, mm -hmm. uh, from uh, my belief is that it was more unlikely for people who were against the war to uh, watch Prigozhin, which was pro-war. And uh, also in the other case, it was uh, very unlikely for people who supported the war to read anti-war sources. So maybe this exposure to the other side was not them. Yeah, so there's uh, th that's a that's a that's a reasonable question about about sort of what people know uh, uh, know before. I mean, Prigozhin was had just launched. Uh, so this is the thing that's tricky about Prigozhin is that on the one hand, before that he was you know, one of the strongest, I mean, certainly as far as the conduct of the war, he was one of the heroes of that uh, war effort. So from that point of view, if you were, if you were a war opponent, you did not like Prigozhin beforehand, right? On the other hand, once he launched the, the mutiny, uh, suddenly that, that whole sort of situation changed. And it's interesting to see that. And you, you see this, the, this very clearly in the data, I didn't show you data on, on support for Prigozhin, but it goes down particularly among the people who, who are in favor of the war and are in favor of, of the government. But there, there is another question about, 
But this this is always the, the, the problem with these kinds of uh, experiments is knowing exactly what is going to be news to people or not, right? Ideally, you could try to do this, if we had run this experiment right after he said it on the 23rd, that would have been amazing because, again, not that the claims are necessarily that novel, but it's much less likely that some people heard about them and some people didn't. In practice, it's obviously very hard to run these kinds of things. You need to get IRP approval. You need to do all kinds of other things and, um, and so on. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, is there a way to um, take into account the fact that some people use, so it's, a, it's an online service, right? Mm -hmm. And you recruit through media uh, advertisement, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I should have, I should have another that, yeah. story yeah. to hear. Um, but uh, can you also do you have uh, measures how often do they consume media? And then maybe that, that will be like proxy mm -hmm. with the exporter to us, all this um, news. Yeah, so we do we do have questions about what kinds of media they consume. We have uh, questions about um, both what types and 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 how much. Um, we cannot, I mean, we did not ask, you know, are you following uh, Grigorje's Telegram channel, for example, or, the, or those kinds of things. But I think you should be able to get a pretty decent proxy of, of the, their types of media habits. Now, again, there are certain types of questions, for example, that the IRB will not let us run. For example, they wouldn't let us uh, ask whether they use a VPN, mm -hmm. right? And so we, and we certainly wouldn't want to ask them to to, to sort of reveal anything that could get them in trouble uh, in, in that sense of breaking the law, which is why we don't we don't ask about the war, we ask about the SMO and so on. You, you don't collect uh, IP addresses? No. No, okay. no we, we, we do not have uh, IP addresses. Uh, what we do get, which is, which is, which is uh, quite interesting, is we get a, an anonymized device ID, mm -hmm. Which allows us to identify whether people have taken the survey more than once, right? Because mm -hmm. so, and just to uh, this is something I should have said, and then I sort of uh, uh, swapped over. So the way these surveys work, unlike typical uh, online panels where some company owns a list of ten thousand people and sends out these these surveys, this basically works uh, uh, through ads that people get uh, on various websites and uh, uh, apps that uh, that. Uh, the, the, the provider uses, and so they see this ad that says, you know, you can get a free recipe or a free article or a free, you know, points for your game or whatever it is, if you take this quick survey. And then if they click on that, they're not being told what the survey is about. If they click on that, they come to our consent form, where we tell them very much, this is a question about political issues, we will ask about the, the war, we will ask about a bunch of different things, at which point they have the option of uh, clicking out when they don't answer any of the other questions, right? Uh, and so there is, uh, there is, but we are told uh, basically we're giving these, these IDs and we can therefore sort of see that there are many people who take this more than once. And so there's, there's an op opportunity and in our old version of the paper, we had some analysis of this as well. You theoretically have at least some opportunity to look at changes, attitudes. So if somebody answered this question in, uh, in January and then asked it, uh, answered it again in fe February and then answered it again in March, we can try to look at uh, whether anything that happened around this per in this person's life or in their town or whatever, you know, maybe they, li they live in, uh, in, in some town that got hit by, uh, by a drone, does that make a difference? Do they think the war is not going so well anymore? Or do they feel more anxious about it and so on? But that's, that's, that's sort of different than it's trying to to, uh, drill down, I mean, maybe it would be worth it, right, to sort of see this combination of the personal experience, and this is part of what work that we're trying, uh, what we're, we're planning on doing, is, is these personal experiences of knowing somebody who has died, having lost a job, or, or having, uh, experiencing economic problems, and how that does or does not then reflect on other types of attitudes. You know, do, do you blame the war, do you blame Putin, or do you blame NATO and the Ukrainians and something like that for us. All right, I'll ask a question. Mm -hmm. So I was really intrigued by the, the last experiment because I was thinking about, I, I'd love to hear you talk more about how you guys are thinking about credibility mm -hmm. in terms of domestic versus foreign actors. Mm -hmm. And so if we think about Russia's attempt to influence uh, attitudes in the US during the 2016 elections, mm -hmm. 
they clearly felt that the way to go about doing this was to try to pretend to be domestic actors, mm -hmm. right? And so your first two examples are these kind of instances of domestic actors. So when you talk about countering, a, you know, you talk about the talk title like countering authoritarian propaganda, mm -hmm. it's almost like you're talking about it from an oppositional standpoint within the regime. But there's a lot of other, there's a lot of this like literature now on information warfare, a lot of interest in information mm -hmm. warfare. And so if you're a Ukrainian actor, if you're a Western actor who's trying to counter Russian government propaganda uh, at its own citizenry. Yeah. Do you think that from what you have seen here today or the way you guys are thinking about this, do you think that um, there's a significant difference about you? I guess my kind of my question is like, does being a domestic actor give you enhanced credibility just by default? Is that why we saw the Russian IRA trolls pretending to be U.S. actors as opposed to being Russian actors? Mm -hmm. Or is there something in this sort of like, you know, in the British case that you looked at here you know, that you makes you think that like, no, maybe not. Actually, you don't need to pose to, you know, like you guys are basically just intercepting web traffic, right? And then and then showing a bunch of Russians messages and saying like, this is a this is what the Brits are saying. Or do you still think that was like, you looked like a domestic actor telling them about what the Brits were saying as opposed to, and I was kind of curious on the decision of whether you went with, B, why you went with BBC versus the Brits are saying, you know, would it have been different if it was like this British actor said this mm -hmm, mm -hmm. straight up, not like we yeah. heard that this is what Brits are saying? So yeah. just in, in in general on that, I'm yeah. curious about how you guys. I mean, look, ultimately, ultimately, this is going to be speculation, right? Uh, I think there's there is, I mean, there there's a question of of who says it. Uh, you know, I mean, the Brits and also the Brits meant a slightly different thing probably in the fall of 22 than they mean now, the, the, all of this sort of diplomatic back and forth uh, ch changes these things. Uh, the, the problem with, the, with the, the Brits are saying is that it's very much a compound treatment, right? On the one hand, it gives it some sort of a credibility. It's not just some random guys telling you something on a survey, but it, uh, and uh, who knows whether it would have been stronger if they had said BBC or, or not. Right. I also don't know what per percentage yeah. of people would have known what BBC is that had the sort of, uh, sort of clear priors about that. Uh, I do think that, that, pro that certainly for a subset of people, anything that comes from the outside, I mean, the regime has tried very hard to paint this picture of the whole world is against us. And therefore anything that comes from the outside should be viewed with suspicion. I certainly think that if it came from a Ukrainian source, the modal response would be, we don't trust these guys, they're just trying to undermine us, right? So the question is, what is what brings you expertise? I mean, the, the, this is this is the quandary, and this is the game that Putin has played very well, is that there is very little credible expertise within Russia that is not taken over by the regime and not painted by the regime as either being traitors in cahoots with these foreign actors, whether or not they have Russian names and uh, Russian credentials and, uh, and so on, right? So th this is in a way the, the sort of, the, the tricky part about designing this experiment that we're trying to do now is to, is to figure out how critical can you be? Because that's the other part, right? I mean, you can be critical about the war not going great, saying that no matter who you are, saying that, they went in there for all the wrong reasons. That's gonna be very, very hard to pull off in the context of saying, here is somebody from the inside, because that's a suicide. That, that, that's, well, as, as we're learning, that's more and more uh, uh, suicidal. And so, so I think what we try to do is we, we'll, we'll try to vary a little bit of this question of how close are you, you know, are you a Russian analyst, are you not, or, or whatever. But we cannot, I mean, it would be great if we could find somebody from United Russia who makes a statement like that and somebody who has not yet been kicked out of their post uh, or fallen out of a window. But those are very really hard to find. Right. Yeah, Sasha. I have a question, I guess, but maybe it's a good follow-up to that. So I'm wondering, like, Who's next on your list then? Like, whose impact are you looking to uh, observe? And like you said, the pool of like potentially credible regime critics is pretty small, especially considering who the war supporters are paying attention to. So, are you going to look at like Z bloggers or like who are you interested in looking at? And then I, I was also wondering if you're interested at all in Russians inside Russia who oppose the war and, and whether, whether that's interesting to you. like. Presumably they're still being, or they're definitely still being exposed to propaganda, right? So are you interested in whether oppositional media is actually having an impact on them? Like whether 
they've already made up their minds or opposition media is actually like, doing what they're trying to do, debunking even for people who already oppose the war at like a baseline level. Um, and my last question was about the foreign agent law um, question that you asked within the Petrova experiment and, and the whether like viewing her as somebody who has a credible take on that. I'm wondering how you know whether people are actually disapproving of the foreign agent law as a result of reading her comment because it's such a big story and like presumably people have been exposed to so much different information about different people who have been added to the foreign agent law. I mean, people sort of already yeah. asked this question, but there's a, a lot of noise there. So the topics that are this big that people are so exposed to all the time, how can you know that this potential credible source is the one that's like swaying them or, or not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll try to answer all of them. We'll see if I remember them all. But, uh, no, no, it's, it, it's, it's fine. Thank you for the questions. Um, so on the, on the last one, um, obviously, and this is the problem, right? Like, unless you ask people something that has just happened, for the most part, at this point on the war, they have heard some version of, uh, of uh, something, you know, like, uh, whether from friends, whether from, uh, for, for the most part, I don't think anyone in Russia has not heard the possibility that the war is not going well or the possibility that you know there are different ways of, of looking at this and so on same thing with the foreign agent law i mean the the beauty of these experiments is that these are you know two sets of people who are similar in every other way other than randomly half of them got this quote from pugachova and the other half of them didn't and you know again th th this is one of the things for those of us who are interested in politics the notion that you could live in Russia and not have thought very much about the foreign agent law seems strange. But I think a lot of Russians go about their lives not really caring that much about it because none of their friends are foreign agents and, uh, and, and so on. And so what we are seeing here are these relatively small differences between people who got this one additional push piece of information about here is this guy who's the husband of this woman. I mean, you know, we don't learn all that much about him, but he, got, uh, he, he was made a foreign agent uh, and his wife says, look, this he's just some regular guy, and well, you know, how is this helping us, right? And so that, that is what we're capturing with these, with these experiments. I would imagine, and this I think gets to the broader question about, about the design to some extent, is that there's sort of a hierarchy of, of issues and of attitudes that, that, we, that we, we need to think about. And at the very basic level, there are certain types of facts, right? Do you or do you not believe that uh, you know, a drone hit this uh, oil refinery today or not, right? And there, the government can try to deny it. You can see videos of it online uh, if, if you spend uh, three and a half minutes doing it. But then the question is, okay, so, so maybe if I give you that information, even if you haven't looked uh, for it, will you believe that it's true or that I sort of generated that video with AI? But then the next question is, okay, if, you, if I show you that, Will you then go and say, okay, therefore I think the war is not going well, which is the bigger step. So that's a sort of evaluation. And then there's another step that says, this is the wrong war and we should be ending it. Right? And, and for each one of these, I mean, part of it is we, we move from things that are sort of factual to things that are rooted in certain types of values and beliefs. Right? I mean, that's how a lot of this stuff has been uh, framed. It's about identity. It's about NATO and everybody trying to attack Russia uh, and so on. And those things are going to be much, much harder to change, certainly with these kinds of short-term uh, with these short-term interventions. And so, in a way, you know, you can you can think of the Prigozhin. I mean, the Prigozhin uh, uh, intervention, in a way, was super strong because here is somebody who has street cred well, battlefield cred, whatever you want to call it, right? Uh, in a way that almost nobody else does. And he comes and says these things that are very negative, right? So, so that, you know, I mean, again, it would have been nice if he had done this video not on the day before he launched a, a, a mutiny. I mean, he may not have done the video if he hadn't been planning to, to launch the mutiny. But that would have been, would have been great because this way we sort of get this post facto after he failed in this uh, in this attempt. But essentially we need to have interventions and that's why, you know, I don't know that some blogger, like any kinds of things that, that are gonna come from somebody who's not a household name in some sort of way. People are gonna say, oh, well, here's this guy, who knows who this guy is? 
are we going to believe him or, uh, him or her or not, right? Uh, and so then we can tell them that this person is an expert. I don't know how much people put these days anyway, how much uh, weight they put on expertise. Certainly not if, it's, if it tells them something that they don't want to hear. Right? So, so that is, but, but I think one of the things that we, we're planning on doing is to try to replicate some of this stuff about looking at effects on the sort of lower hanging fruit about changing information, uh, changing certain beliefs about information versus these upper level things that are gonna be much harder to change, certainly when, certainly not, not in, in sort of a single experiment. And anyone else in here? Anybody online who wants to ask a question? All right. Okay. Well, we got one more. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, Great. Sorry. Just a comment. I think that this the clash thing is uh, very interesting. As far as I understand, that from my heart, it's only with Bugachova case, uh, but it's got me thinking because back clash, uh, like that people say that okay, this person that she can't comment on that thing because she doesn't have expertise in that. So I interpret it as. Uh, not given enough credit to this um, to this particular persona of saying that, and uh, it got me thinking how exactly uh, people think about uh, who should talk about what and how it it's uh, it, and if it has something to do with uh, the original partisanship. Because, uh, for example, could Prigozhin be not uh, credited as an expert enough of saying about the military stuff? Is the person in in uh, it doesn't agree with them. Uh, it also reminds me of, um, you know, this case that uh, Ukrainians, like um, in a uh, relative in Ukraine, uh, they uh, would say that, okay, we are now under fire and the people uh, in Russia wouldn't uh, give them credit enough of, you know, so yeah, it's the comments on that. We wouldn't believe on that, even though they definitely have expertise in that because they live through war. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, thank you for bringing it up, and, and that, that I think is uh, is the. I mean, there 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 are these multiple steps, and for some people, that confirmation bias or whatever you are is going to be so strong that anything that sounds like, you know, we are doing the wrong thing is going to be pushed on. And I've heard these kinds of stories uh, as as well of, of people talking to their relatives and them saying. You're like, look, we're being shot at here. Like, no, this is not true, or it's your own guys who are doing it, or right. Yeah. Uh, so there's there is that element, and and again, people resist and they resist, and there's a question whether at some point, if they see it from enough different uh, uh, from enough different people, whether they eventually think, well, maybe it's this. But then the 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 part that makes me really pessimistic is that even if you see this, you can still think. Okay, yes, but they're run by a bunch of Nazis and they're out to kill uh, Russians and uh, and whatever else. And therefore, and this is uh, th this I didn't bring up because it was it's not in, in the same framing. But in the one where we had the the framing about um, uh, ab about uh, the flawed operation, where the Brits are saying we had another arm of the experiment that had a quote from somebody that said, you know, our boys are dying, but that's because we're fighting Nazis, and you know. Essentially, this is what happened during World War II. We're fighting Nazis and our boys died, and that's just how it is. Right? So it's you can get the same facts and get a completely different framing. And this is sort of a different way of, you know, this uh, was an Asukal paper about, uh, about the economic, uh, framing economic uh, uh, news in, uh, in Russia as well, right? What they show there, unlike with the war, is that, that, that same facts get reported. It's just that the good things are attributed to Putin and the bad things are uh, attributed to the others. Here, you get more of, uh, you know, uh, more of a, uh, of a situation where not even the same facts are reported, right? There's all kinds of stuff that you're not allowed to show. But to the extent that you show it, it, it uh, sort of goes in the, in, the, in the other direction. And the thing that I worry about uh, is uh, that, that we sort of showed, uh, that we, you saw in, in one of the experiments, right? Is that, again, you can sort of think that the war is going badly, and it may actually push you in the wrong direction as far as the war goes. You might sort of think, well, in that case, we may have to attack here, or we need to nuke them, or we need to do whatever else, right? If these evaluations clash with, with your overall understanding of the world, that's going to be very, very hard to achieve. 
and increasingly hard in the context in which there's no and with Navalny's death too, but even before his death, he was he was shut down so so effectively, right? Somebody to tell uh, alternative narrative that that can really sort of reframe this in a, in an effective way, right? I, 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 we haven't seen that. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, there's there's a there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I think there's definitely part of the problem is uh, that there is a, this sort of a little bit echoes my my answer to the previous question is that you know there is not I mean this vision of Russia being able to join the EU or join the West or, or whatever which was sort of there in the in the nineties and then it, uh, it basically fell by the way. How the hell yeah for them. It's very hard to see it, right? Uh, and and uh, and again, it, you know, Sweden just joined NATO, uh, uh, all of this stuff. So in a way, their their whole thing about the whole world being against them. I mean, it's obviously not the whole world because they still have some very fine allies, including North Korea and uh, you know, <laughs> etc. Et but but increasingly, obviously, this has this has further mobilized and in a way sort of reinforces this notion of of being surrounded and. It's interesting because this I, I have this uh, I mean the way these narratives work uh, I remember I was uh, I was in uh, uh, Moscow in uh, 2016 I believe on some sort of an exchange uh, thing and I was talking to a young Russian student and he was very friendly and and so on wanted to talk to me and but he said you know basically his question was why is it that every time the Europeans get together they gang up against Russia. And I said, okay, can you tell me sort of what you mean by that? It's like, well, you know, first Napoleon and then uh, Hitler and then the EU. And I said, okay, first of all, I don't think most of the Europeans were that on board with either Napoleon or Hitler. Uh, and But just sort of the notion that this is what they come, uh, what, how this sort of narrative is done is, right, is that it's the West against us. And of course, some of the things that, that, the, the the transition of the '90s did not help this this rhetoric because they were not you know welcomed with open arms uh, though they, they could have gone certainly much much farther than they did uh, uh, etc. There's still a question whether the EU would have wanted Russia with its size and all of its problems and so on and so on in it. But but this sort of notion of us versus them is so ingrained there and the ability and this is the amazing part. I mean to be able to to frame the invasion of another country in the same way that you frame the defense of your country. Now, of course, there's a good parallel, which is Ribbentrop-Molotov and, and all of that uh, part to World War II. But that is something else that the Russians don't really want to support. Right? And so this victimization narrative, which, by the way, is not just a Russian thing. There's plenty of people everywhere in the world, lots of East Europeans. Every East European you talk to will tell you a story of, of national victimization. Right, so that's not a, a sort of quintessential Russian thing, but it's be, it's very effectively used in Russia. Like this, right? 
And so I think that that part of it makes this particularly intractable, not to speak of the fact that, yes, will we have deputinization trials? Will we, will we have war criminal? There's, there's a whole massive set of questions about war crimes, about all of that, that any post-Putin leader is going to have to deal with in a very complicated way. And so the, the extrication from this, even if you were to say, okay, this war is not going well, it's not the right war, where do you go from there? Can I come back to the credibility question? Uh, just bring it back in that direction. And this sort of builds off of Sasha's question. So if you have a limited number of, you know, opposition figures who are speaking out right now mm -hmm. um, to get your, you know, like Prigozhin was a pretty unique set of circumstances, right? We don't see like military leaders coming out against the war in that kind of way. And obviously it's endogenous to what happened to Prigozhin probably, right? But but if you think about other sources, mm -hmm. right, of anti, of, of, you know, other credible sources that might be out there, there's the foreign ones that I asked about earlier. Mm -hmm. But then I can think of two others. Like one is the Russian diaspora community, mm -hmm. right? And that's the, you know, all these people who are trying to, the voices of Russians who've left. Mm -hmm. And the other is the non Prigozhin's, the non pop stars, the non, you know, famous people. And, and this kind of makes me think back to like the Soviet days where everybody talked about like, well, what would you talk about around your kitchen table or something like that? So have you guys thought about friends and family as credible? I mean, I know we've all heard these like awful stories about people talking to their relatives in Ukraine. Like you've already mm -hmm. been sort of recounting mm -hmm. those. But like when you guys are thinking about credible messages, mm -hmm. I wonder if it's like if it's your kid, if it's your neighbor, if it's in a more private context, not the people who are going to. You know, not you're going to have an effect on, you know, the number of people that are going to could have an effect on, but like, and, and then how you think about that from an experimental context, but like, there's lots of people who have friends and family who might quietly be opposed to these things. And do you think of where does, where does that fit in terms of this theory about credibility in, in so far as like, yeah, if my neighbor tells me something, they probably don't have credibility about the military operation, but they have credibility about like caring about me and thinking about me. So I don't know if you guys have you thought yeah, about going yeah, in that yeah. direction at all? With well, that? so so I think that, that that's that's a good question. I think you're right that, that if the you know there's only so you know same thing in you know in the in the eighties with Afghanistan, uh, you know there was not a there was not a free media and and so on, but still. The body bags, uh, sort of the, the the deaths there started uh, had an effect uh, uh, as right. as well, right? So so there are other types of stories. Uh, we do have questions. We ask people about whether some the, somebody a friend or relative has died, and then also whether somebody they know of somebody else who's not necessarily a close friend or relative. Um, and on that, actually, we're sort of this is preliminary. But the people who know somebody who has died are not more anti-war. If anything, they're maybe more pro-war. And some of that may be selection, right? Because the types of people whose relatives go to war might be different than the ones who don't. Uh, but some of it may also be, I don't want this person to have died in vain, right? Uh, what we see is that people who are farther removed but still know about these deaths, they tend to be more critical. So it may be this sort of weaker links. There may be this question of, of there being just enough of a concentration in certain places to where suddenly it's like, okay, I don't believe this, I don't believe this, I don't believe this, but I know all of these people who have died, how can they tell us that this is that this is uh, uh, going well, right? And then possibly not just the dead, but the people who come back and tell the stories, the soldiers who come back and tell the stories about the types of things that they experienced uh, in Ukraine and the fact that they're not being, you know, met with flowers and uh, happiness and, and all of that, right? So, so there's that. The other question there, it's hard to, it's hard to disentangle, is this question of who you know. And so we have some questions about, you know, are people around you mostly in favor of the war, mostly not, and so on. And those things work in the direction that you would expect. Right. But of course, it's hard to manipulate that, right? I mean, you, you could theoretically say, I don't know, did you know that this many people in your town are whatever, but... We don't want to make up data. Right. Uh, we can't lie about it. And the problem is that, frankly, most of the interventions would not be very efficient, effective, because they would be, you know, that most people in your town support the war. That wouldn't help, right? So, so there, there are these questions of there are definitely these pockets, but that's and we do have we have another question, which is about to what extent do you think you would get in trouble by criticizing the war in different types of contexts, and there we have. Options include friends and family, people at work, uh, et cetera, speaking in public, and then including surveys. Uh, 
because part of it is we're trying to understand to what extent people are worried about it. And as you'd expect, people are not that worried about talking to their friends and family, but they are much more worried about talking in other types of contexts. And you know, from our perspective, they seem to be less worried about online surveys than they are about either in-person or phone surveys, which makes some sense because there's an extra degree of, uh, of anonymity with this. Anyone else? All right, well then please join me in thanking Grigo and his co-author, Shaisa Tibidolo.